You have a way of terrifying me um, at times. I hope you realize this. Um, sometimes I think something's bad and then I read something that you write. I'm like, holy crap, it's way worse. And uh, you did this with, with me in this Google Gemini uh, AI story. And I wanna, I wanna get to where you see this going and, and all the dangers associated with it. But let's start like kind of at the surface level here. Uh, Gemini is released with this, this um, you know, photo generating service, which we've seen from other providers. And look, it's impressive in a lot of ways, but what we found almost immediately was, the, let's say the historical rememberings of, of Gemini were a little at odds with what actually happened. Yeah, after a couple different people started playing with the AI and its photo generation, they started realizing that it was very hard to get it to produce any white people, specifically in historical context. It seems like the AI was coded to increase diversity in all situations, even situations where it made no sense. So if you tried to, say, uh, create an image of a pope or a Viking or a medieval knight, none of them would be white people, even to the point where if you attempted to create a soldier in 1940s Germany, you got a wide and diverse uh, SS rather than many of what people would think of as the average Nazi. And so all of a sudden there was a big outcry because it was very clear that Google had created a AI that was incapable of actually reflecting history accurately. Yeah, and, and what's, of course, important when it comes to this is not just, I mean, look, I'm sure I could not design, certainly, a photo a generation service. It's hard. It's probably really hard to do. You could see there being mistakes made. We all kind of understand that as, as we're learning about this technology. There are mistakes. There are weird things that happen that they don't fully understand. I mean, it's creepy, but we all kind of see that as part of the picture. This, though, is really clearly specifically designed to do certain things like eliminate white people from history. And it's because, I mean, the people behind it seem to be crazy, woke CRT types that are, are, are programming and whatever you put into these systems is what you get out of them. That's right. It wasn't just the images. When people gave the AI different inquiries, like, should you eliminate whiteness? It immediately said, oh, well, that's complicated. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, you know, uh, history studies or white, white studies in, in universities. But if you asked it to, should we eliminate blackness, it correctly said, oh, no, that's terrible. That's that's a terrible question even to ask. And it repeatedly had this kind of ideological bent where any question that you fed into it would just reveal the, the woke ideology that had been deeply coded into the AI. So like you said, it's not just that it was producing extra fingers or some weird un uncanny valley effects that we kind of expect from much of this technology. It was like we were able to peer directly into the heart of those that had programmed the AI. And what we saw was a really ugly progressive agenda. Hmm. And it seems like people kind of did their homework and try to figure out who was running these systems and the people at Google. And, you know, you go see some of their social media postings, some of the videos they've made. I mean, it seems to, to check out that they are really far down this road. They believe in all of the uh, woke nonsense. And, and I mean, it's no surprise when it comes to Google. But at this point... Uh, you know, you, you, every one of these companies seems to have the same style of person they put behind these projects, and that's a real problem. Yeah, increasingly we're realizing that in every aspect of our life, personnel is going to shape what comes next. There is no such thing as a neutral institution, and therefore there is no such thing as neutral technology. Technology will always be shaped by the people who create it, the worldview, the values, the principles of the people who are coding it, who are creating it, will be reflected in what it does. And so when we look at these different organizations like Google, which control a vast network of different uh, critical pieces of infrastructure, but most importantly, the search engine, which basically dictates how a lot of people interact with pretty much all of the information available online, their values are going to routinely be reflected in the way that people get search results. And so while the AI is the most chilling thing because it's all concentrated and upfront, we have to start thinking about what this means for all the other aspects of products and information that Google delivers. Because if this kind of ideology is baked in to their AI, then it's also probably present in every other piece of technology they produce. Yeah, and, and you know, it's, it's interesting because the, the mistake here, if I have this right, Oren, because they did admit, uh, gosh, we got this wrong. And I wasn't impressed by their apology, but they did come out and say, hey, we got this wrong, and, and here's why. But what they got wrong, and they did make a mistake here, but what they got wrong was it was supposed to be subtle, right? Like, they, they designed this to do this thing. They just didn't, they didn't plan on it being so overt that everyone would notice. 
when they drew, a, you know, try to get a picture from, uh, you know, the 1700s of the founders. And it's all, you know, it's all uh, black and Native American and Asian people. They wanted this effect. They just didn't want people to notice it. And that's where their mistake is. Am I right? Yeah, that's exactly right. The non-apology that we're so used to came out. But like you said, they weren't really apologizing for anything. None of, it, none of this is a mistake. It was all intended. It was just supposed to be more subtle. It was supposed to slowly boil the frog in the pot, not hit it all at once. The reason that Gemini was dangerous for the left was not that it had the wrong type of ideology or produced unintended results. The problem is that it was too clear. It was like you could summon a little stupid demon <laughs> that was required to tell you what leftists actually believe. And when you actually saw it all up front at once, you realize how horrifying it was. Mm, okay. And so this is the background of the story. And this is where Art McIntyre makes me terrified of the world because I, you went down a road of, hey guys, you know, AI, this AI thing, yeah, kind of funny, kind of bad. But let's not forget what else Google has control of. And I think we all kind of jump to search, right? Like we all think, okay, search, it really does control search. We talked about, about that, how they can influence elections with, you know, news story selection. And that's all really important. But you brought it to education and so many other aspects of our life. Can you kind of walk people through how ingrained in our society Google really is? Sure, I'm only a few years removed from teaching in a public school classroom, so I'm familiar with the procedures in a way that most people probably in our media sphere aren't. And Google is an essential part of basically all public schools. They've worked very hard to make the Chromebook a ubiquitous part of public education. Your child turns all of their assignments in on Google Classroom. They're all assigned there. That's where their stuff is graded. All of their different apps integrate directly in with the Google uh, suite. You, you're using Google Docs, you, Google Spreadsheets, Google Slides for everything that they turn in. And so that means that your child isn't just using Google to search, though that would already be bad enough because it's only producing the type of information that you would get from the kind of people who program an AI like Jim and I. But on top of that, that means that every time they're interacting with education, every time they're looking for answers, every time they're creating something to turn in, it's always interfacing with the Google suite. Google has invested a lot of time and money to make sure that every time a uh, young person attempts to validate truth, they have to do so through Google's architecture. So they control the entire algorithmic universe in which students learn. The idea that a student would go to the library and go ahead and check their assignments, uh, you know, look, look for independent sources of information, original sources, those kind of things that aren't constantly monitored by a woke, <laughs> woke algorithm that is sorting out wrong think, that doesn't even occur to them. They just type whatever they want into one of the Google uh, apps. It searches through the Google uh, algorithm, and then it produces the results and they regurgitate them for their assignment. There's no understanding of any kind of individual search for truth or any other way to validate the uh, quality of facts that they're putting out there. It's, it's really terrifying when you think about it that way, because it's not just, I mean, it's scary because you have kids who are doing um, projects on all of these systems and the, their source of information is Google. But it also goes the other way. All of their thoughts, all of the, you know, the ways they create then goes back through the Google system, which can be aggregated for God only knows what purpose. And this is not just in public schools. It's in private schools as well. Uh, you know, I mean, look, you know, Google can design some good products and, you know, they're, they're easy to use. They, you know, they, they are able to do things that a lot of other companies don't do very well. So it's very user friendly. People get on there and they use these things. But now we're getting the situation where both ways our kids are basically in the middle of this Google information collection and distribution system. That's exactly right. And, you know, there used to be an option to opt out. Many teachers understood the problems with digital only education. You lose a lot of skills. Kids don't have the ability to read or write physically, research, open a textbook, look for answers. They just expect to type everything in and immediately get something regurgitated back to them. But it's so much worse than that, because on top of this, after the covid pandemic, everyone was forced to go to remote, remote learning, which means any holdouts, any teachers or administrators who were skeptical of this type of learning were pushed out or forced to go digital regardless because otherwise you couldn't operate the classroom. And when the students came back to physical in-person education, none of that changed. 
So all of the teachers are required to put everything onto Google at any moment because if the student's out sick or if they just don't feel like attending class, the administrators are still pushing for them to be able to turn everything in through the Chromebook. And so therefore, there's just no escape, even for teachers who realize how deleterious this constantly online education is to the students, because all of it is mandated top down by the school district and the wider learning apparatus. It's, it's really terrifying. I, I don't want to get too philosophical on you here, uh, Orrin, but there was a, a John Mayer song that came out uh, uh, you know, 20 years ago or so uh, called Waiting, on the world to, Waiting for the World to Change, I think it was called. And it was mm. essentially a, uh, a Iraq war protest song, I think, at the time. And it, and it was basically like, hey, like, we're not really going to be able to do anything about this right now, but uh, eventually the world will change and we'll get in control and, and then things will change. And I remember thinking at the time, like, it was such a, it was just sounded like people who didn't want to do any work, like, they didn't want to be like, ah, we're just going to go to bars, we can't really do anything about this. But in reality, we're seeing the effects of essentially that. Right. Like people who have come up in this system, who have been in the public school system, who have been taught all this nonsense about what our history is, are now rising to the levels where they are running Google AI and they are uh, running the newsroom at The New York Times and getting even old school liberal journalists fired for being too open to conservative thought. We are in the middle of this, you know, revolution. I don't really know how to undo it. Honestly, do you have any idea? <laughs> am, am I too pessimistic on this or too optimistic? Unfortunately, I think you're probably right. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Abolition of Man back in the 1940s. And in that book, he predicted that once our social engineers figured out how to go ahead and reprogram humanity, how to control every input and output so that they could go ahead and change the way that humans think and interact, they would effectively abolish man. The next generation would lose what it meant to be human. They would not be in contact with the traditions and the things that really make us who we are. I think the only good news, the only bright spot about this is that uh, ultimately human beings can't survive this way. The woke are pushing us to a mode of being that simply cannot continue. We can see this in the failures of the systems around us. We simply aren't able to maintain certain things due to the competency crisis. People are poorly adjusted spiritually, emotionally, uh, educationally, in every way you can imagine. Eventually something has to break and that's a scary way to think about how this might end. But ultimately, I think that we, we can't continue to go on this way. And so eventually, I think we will select for people who did opt out of this stuff, who were able to go ahead and connect their children with a way of being a tradition and understanding of the world that is more grounded and real. But I think we've got a hard time ahead before that happens. And I will say we should let the record show that when you needed a reference, you went to C.S. Lewis and I went to John Mayer. And I don't know what that <laughs> says about our particular shows. It's probably not good for me, though. Uh, Blaze News columnist Aaron McIntyre. Uh, be sure to catch him here right here on Blaze TV, the Aaron McIntyre Show. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast. Aaron, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. I appreciate it. Thanks, man.